I'm going to start with the UV process. I'm going to go up here to workspace, go into the UV editing view. Then I'm going to go into the UV menu and tear it off. One thing I'm not going to do is have two different pieces of geometry share the same tile, because when you do that, then in ZBrush, if you try to push out EXR displacement maps, it'll tell you cannot merge maps for two different items on the same tile. So I'm going to try to avoid doing that. And I definitely want uh, EXR displacement maps. Uh, they feel a lot safer than other formats. So I'll refrain from uh, putting uh, two different items on the same tile. I'll start with this shell. This shell already is open-ended, so I can unfold it in the view. Actually, before I get started, I'm going to select all the pieces that were imported. And I'm going to go to the UV menu and go planar. All right, this is just to get them started with something, which is a requirement for some of the tools that I'm about to use. You need to have some type of a UV shell. All right, so with this one, since it's open-ended, all I have to do is just go to the UV shell. So I'm going to grab its UV shell, go to the unfold menu, go unfold, and that should open it for me. I will also optimize it. That's something I usually try to do, and then I'll lay it out, and it will put it in the towel perfectly. But uh, to be on the safe side, I am going to hold down Shift, click Layout, and make sure that it always gives me a certain amount of padding uh, in pixels. So I will go with a tile padding of maybe four pixels and apply. Yeah, and this just shows that it doesn't cross over because that, that is a problem that Substance Painter will, will warn you about and won't allow you to import anything if you don't have it. So all uses of uh, the layout tool now should use this setting. And I will, since this is my first one, I'll get its textile density. I want to make sure my map size is 8192 because I'm going to be using mostly 8K maps. So I'll get this textile density as is. And I'll move on to the next item which is the top bun singe. So I will, this one could use two splits. I will make the splits on the side here. So I'll grab the 3D cut and sew tool, hold down shift and drag my mouse to cut. And I'll go do the same thing on the other side, hold down shift and drag my mouse to cut and do that, make sure I cut in the correct way. Okay. I can grab this by its UV shell, both of them unfold, optimize, set textile density. That's what the textile density that matches the top one that I just did. So I'm going to try to fit this in here. Let's see if I have any issues and it fits fine. I do want this singe to share a material with the top bun shell. So I'm going to grab the singe and I'm going to move it into the next UV tile. So I'll go to transform and then I'll shift it one unit, which is amounts to a single tile and I'll just shift it. And so I just have it over there. So that way uh, I'm using UDIM tiling for the asset. So this one is also an open-ended mesh. So that's also fairly simple. I'll do an unfold. and optimize, set textile density, and that's the size. Make sure it's within view and then shift it to the third tile. 
So now the top button is UV'd. I'm going to grab it, group it. Top bun, top bun GRP for group. And that's the first UV item. And I'll just go ahead and apply a material to it now. So I'll assign a new material and I'll pick the Arnold Standard Surface Shader. And I'll rename the shader AISS. Top bun. This is a naming format I like to use. And then I'll identify it as a material. All right, I'm going to move on to the cucumbers. I'll start with this one. And I'm going to cut these cucumbers at the very bottom over here. So I'll grab my cut UV tool and just make a cut here the bottom it's not a big deal this bottom is not really exposed at all but I will uh, and I'm going to turn on this because it lets me know and I hold on control to uncut and I'm going to find the back of it because I do want to slice it in the back okay so I'll grab this object just so it unwraps a little better so I'll come to the back over here and slice it Now, if this was a, a game asset, I wouldn't be doing this thing where I don't allow assets to share tiles. If I have a limited number of tiles I can use, I can't just be spreading things across tiles. But because this is a film asset, I don't really mind um, having it use as many tiles as needed. And it's not that hefty of an asset anyway. It's just a handful of assets. So I don't mind spreading them across tiles. Okay, so I can now grab the shell and go to the UV kit, unfold, optimize, and set the textile density. Fit it in the tile, its own tile. Move on to the next cucumber. Give it the same treatment. Just cut underneath here. I'll find the back side of it. And slice up just so it opens up better. Okay. Have the UV shell, unfold, optimize, set textile density, move it into the next tile. Now it's time to get the seeds. With these seeds, I'm going to trust the very uh, simple auto seams feature. So I'll hit auto seams and see what that gave me. So I will go and fold, optimize, and it's not bad. Yeah, it's fine. I should actually set the textile density first. Yeah. And now it matches the textile density of everything. Okay. 
it's not a good idea to use layout after you've set textile density because it will just ruin the textile density. Actually, let me test this. This seems to be a command to tell it to preserve ratios. I just want to see if it will keep the textile density that I set. So if I go UV shell and I go apply, no, it'll resize them. I don't want that. I want to keep the same textile density. Yeah, this might be the wrong command. Let me see scale mode off and apply. No. Yeah, uh, I don't use layout after I set textile density. So let me get the last uh, seed. and I should be able to then apply materials to this. So with this one, I'll go auto seams again. I'm just gonna go in and check to make sure it did a good job unraveling them. Uh, well, it looks like it did. All right, so I'll move this to the fourth tile. And now I should have these four items with one material assigned to them. So assign a new material, standard surface shader, Call it AISS Q Converse Matt. Get this move down, get this spicy sauce, grab the UV tool. And I'll try to cut out of view yet again at the bottom. That should suffice. And just let it breathe a little. I'll go to the back and Uh, this is a 3D cut and sew tool in the shelf. And I'll just give a cut up here just to let it breathe a bit. Here, go to UV shell. Go to my UV toolkit, unfold, optimize. Let me spread them out. Set the textile density. And these two, they will share two tiles. This is how I'm going to get them to fit because at the correct textile density, they can't fit into one tile. All right, move to the cheese. Give it the same treatment. These actually two pieces of cheese melted together. So I'll slice at the bottom. Fold, optimize, set the textile density, move this into the second tile. And I did forget to add a material to this. I'll right click here, add a new material. Yeah, it says sauce top, that. And I'll add one to this one, assign new material. AISS. Cheese. 
desktop map. I'm going to go through and delete history on all the meshes I've done. And that's another thing I'm going to try to con do consistently. It stores all that information and it's not needed once the item is UV'd. So I'm going to select all these and go edit, delete by type, history. So it clears all that history. All right, when it comes to this very complex mesh, as I mentioned in the previous lesson, I'm not going to try to UV by hand. I'm going to go with the UV automatic. All right, so it took a really long time because it is a pretty dense mesh, but that's fine. Like I said, this thing is just going to have uh, general transmission settings. There are no maps that are going to be painted for this. Seems to do a good job sorting everything out, making sure it doesn't hit the corners, even without layout. So automatic is pretty good. I'm going to take these. These are the charred pieces of meat. We'll give it an automatic map. This mesh is, is not a big deal. It's not going to be subdivided. It's not going to get any um, uh, displacement. It's just going to get paint color. And for the most part, I think it's just going to be one paint color. Uh, I am considering just maybe varying it, putting a noisier uh, base color on it, uh, but that is just a filter that I'm going to apply in Substance Painter. I don't actually have to go in and manually paint the noise. It's just a simple filter. So I think it's fine. I don't see any issues with it. Yeah, it did a pretty good job unraveling it. I just wanted to see if Odyssey could, would work. But yeah, I don't care if this mesh is it's problematic. It's not, it's not a big deal. It's not gonna be subdivided or have anything super important done to it. All right, so it's time to move on to these paddy chunks. They are all down here. So I'm going to start with the one at the center, which is really the simplest one. And this one could use an auto seam. I'll try, I'll trust auto seam with it. Let's see what auto seam does. UV shell, unfold, optimize, set textile density and did a pretty good job it's not bad Make sure it's in here and move on to the next one these ones i don't want to touch anything in the front so i'm going to cut it in the back so i'll cut Over here in the back, like so. And cut from around this area. Get like a cross. And that should suffice. And UV shell. Unfold, optimize, set textile density, and it should be fine. Move it into the next tile. These are going to use a handful of tiles. I'm going to use the lower tiles for the top paddy and then the tiles up here for the bottom paddy. They are the same thing, so they're going to use the same material. And that will also apply for the cheese that's under this uh, fluid mesh. Let me actually try to find it. It's the bottom cheese, this one. Might as well UV it right now so I can put it on layer with its uh, with the other cheese asset. And we'll object, cut. And I'm going to cut as close to the edge as possible. Not that these seams matter. Uh, these programs do a pretty good job of ensuring that no seams really show through, but I'm accustomed to ensuring that seams don't uh, stay away from uh, the more visible part of the asset. That's why I'm, I'm doing my best to make choices for them that keep them out of view, but it's not a big deal. You can cut whichever way you want. Okay, so this 
also receive the same treatment. Unfold, optimize, set textile density, and move it into its respective tile. Make sure it's not touching the edges. And with this one, it's going to share tiles with the other cheese assets. So I'm going to grab these two shells and shift them one, two units so that when I select it, this cheese and the cheese up here, they are all sharing uh, the same material. So I'm going to make sure I right click and assign existing and AISS. I call the cheese top, but I should change the name to cheese. Go to the attribute editor and just say cheese. Yeah, SS cheese. All right, let me continue with these uh, patties. I'll actually pause the video and get them done the same way I did uh, that single one, and I'll come back to continue. It's just a, a very simple cross from around here. These UV tools have gotten very powerful, so you can do things very quickly. Bring it to about there. I think that should be enough. And I'll go to the bottom and cut from about there. All the way up to about there should be enough. I'm going to go to the V shell and fold, optimize, set textile density, and make sure it's in the next tile. So that's this one done, that one done, the center one done. And I'm gonna pause the video, get these done the same way, and I'll be back. I was able to get all the chunks of the center patty done. So this is them. And they're arranged from the zero, zero to the uh, 10 tile. So everything on the bottom row is for the top patty. Now I'm gonna do the bottom patty and arrange them over here. I do have to mention that a few of these meshes uh, we're returning errors uh, when I try to UV them. Uh, the unfold tool will not UV them if it has non-manifold geometry. And for some reason it had it and the Maya cleanup tool could not get rid of it. So I had to go back into ZBrush and remesh these uh, the same way I did in, in the lesson where I was remeshing this. I painted a more dense color here to allow for uh, more topology in the area that's more exposed. Some of the uh, bottom chunks, I, I just tried to UV the bottom chunks and one of them had that error too. So I went back and fixed it the same way and uh, treated it like the top uh, patty, allocated more geometry to this region. I just took an opportunity to do that. But I just wanted to come back to show you how I'm going to cut these bottom patties. So I'm going to give it a planar UV first. And for this one, I'm going to cut through it like this. Actually, let me get a little closer to the edge. So I'll cut from here and keep it fairly close. I think it's fine. All 
you know, I also have to remind myself it's not a big deal. These seams can be almost anywhere. It's not going to break anything. Uh, but just for the sake of good, good old school practice of keeping them in obscure areas, I'm going to be careful. And then what I'm going to do is cut this backside just so it's it can spread out better and it can fit uh, in the tiles better. But the key area is this front here. I'm going to give it the treatment, select the UV shell and fold. Optimize. And it looks like I didn't, uh, so one of the areas is still connected. So it looks like my, uh, I didn't get through in some areas. So I'm going to select this edge and just cut it here to separate it. And then I'm going to optimize this and then set the textile density. Yeah, and it looks like they might all fit in one tile. So that's a good thing. I'm gonna position this here, there, and there. But I'm going to move it up because everything down here is the uh, top uh, patty. So I'm going to go into the transform tab and just hit up to move it up one unit. So now uh, this is the entire top patty and the bottom starts here. I'm going to group this better. So I'll call this top patty GRP and put the bottom patty in its group. Bottom patty GRP. All right, so I'm going to go and treat the next four chunks the same way I just did uh, this one, and I'll be back when um, I'm done. All right, so I'm done with all the patties. So the top patty, bottom patty, they all share one material, and these are the tiles they occupy. So the 10 to, I think, 14 is what they all occupy, and all the meshes are clean, one material. Actually, they're not clean yet. Anyway, this is the materials, AISS patties. I'm going to take all these, just like I did with the top stuff, and edit, delete by type, history. And I think one item I forgot to apply material to, well, I'll do it shortly, but these are, these are charred meat, this, and there's some at the bottom too, so I'll find the bottom one. Uh, it's a little harder to find in here. There it is. Okay, so this is a charred meat. I'll group them together. Call it charred meat TRP. And assign them a material. As I mentioned, these will have uh, no subdivision levels. So I'll just right click, assign new material. AISS charred meat map. And uh, it's going to be good because these this faceting will help with that charred feel. Uh, it's worked in a previous project, and I think it will work here too. It'll just give it some sharper shapes ra rather than the crescent feel that will, I'll get if I was to subdivide it. I don't want too many crescent shapes because it's burnt meat and it needs to have some... Uh, some hard edges to it, but we'll see how it turns out. When it comes to the charred meat, I've decided to just spread them across two different tiles. It's no big deal. Once again, these things are not gonna have maps. I'm doing the same thing for these fluid meshes for the patties. All right, so there's two more things to UV, the bottom bun and this fluid mesh. So let me get this underway. This one is also fairly simple. I'm going to cut uh, right here on the inside all the way around. All right, that should be fine. 
I'll grab the UV shell, unfold, optimize. It looks like it's still attached somewhere. I have to get in there and cut it. The attachment point. Right there, I'll double click uh, on this edge, select the whole line. All right, that might not be a smart idea. I might have to. Let me just find out where it is. Okay, right there. And I'll take my cut tool. Yes. Get it. And fold again. Optimize. Set the textile density. And that's a little scary. That means this might have a problem fitting. I have to cheat a little, just a little bit. Um, zoom in and see what I can get away with. Yeah, I might have to cheat just a little bit. I'll scale it down just a little. It's not a big deal. About that much. That shouldn't hurt. I'll try to keep it just a little bit on the larger side. Yeah, that should be fine. It's just slightly different textile density just to make it fit. Make sure it's not touching the edges. Okay, looks good. This one also gets its own material because it's a fusion of sauce and button. So it's I'm gonna have it's gonna have its unique maps. So I assign a new material. Call it AISS bottom bun. Matte. And that means now I have one more item to UV and I'll be ready to send all the stuff back to ZBrush. Actually, I have more than that. I do have the onions. Now let me get this fluid mesh. So with this fluid mesh, I'm going to slice it into two pieces. I think that should suffice. I'll slice here. On the sides. Actually, there's a cleaner way to do this specifically for this. And I'll hold down shift, move up and move down. And I should probably do it to the other side too. Just a little cleaner of a cut. So I'll hold down shift all the way up, hold down shift. And this one might need a little bit of a rerouting. Okay, that looks good. Let me make sure I have like the halfway point. Might need to slice this into four pieces. Actually, I'm almost certain that I do. I don't think this thing is going to fit. If it does, I'll just do this again. Let me grab this. I'll try to keep it a minimal number of pieces. Let me see what I get on an unwrap. So unfold, optimize, unfold, optimize. Yeah, this thing is not going to fit. If I set the textual density, yeah, it's a little huge. All right, I'll cut this right down the center. Let me see if this one can actually fit diagonally. 
and then maybe the other two will sit. Yeah, it'll work like that. I'll slice right down the center, cut. Got that one to fit. Try to get this one to fit here. And this one might not be so easy. Yeah, I might need to utilize the uh, space a lot better. So I need to make another cut. It's gonna be four pieces. And that seems to be the way this is going to fit correctly. Yeah, it's not pretty, but it's a solution. All right, so that's the fluid mesh. And now it's time for these onions. So I'll grab the onions for the bottom patty. These ones I will use auto UV, auto seams, and unravel it. Optimize. Set the textile density, and they can just sit in this tile here. Fortunately, they have to get their own tile. And do the same one for the top patties. Go all the same. Once again, each separate piece of geometry gets its own tile because in ZBrush, if you try to bake displacement maps in EXR format for meshes that share the same tile, it'll tell you it cannot merge the maps. So I want EXR displacement files. They can be trusted better than any other format to do what they're supposed to do. But if you have a good experience working with other file formats for displacement, you don't have to worry about this. I'm going to take this, make sure I set the text density and shift it into the next tile. Last one is the charred onions. This one I will, I will select it and go Auto seams. Unfold, optimize, set textile density, and move it into the third tile. And these three tiles will be the onions. So assign new material, standard surface, go AISS. Onions map. Then I'll group them. Call it onions GRP. And I think that should be it. I'll put the cucumbers in their own group. this cucumbers GRP and the cheese in its own group cheese GRP 
This is a piece that came here that wasn't supposed to come, so I'll delete it. Same with this one. This is fluid under bottom bun. And that can actually share a material with the patty fluid meshes. So I'll put it in here and I'll just assign it the material I created for the patty fluid meshes. I can find it right there, patty fluid meshes. It's gonna be the same thing. This is the bottom bun. This is the main fluid mesh, top source, and I think that's it. That's all the meshes. So I can put them in one group called cheese burger GRP. And before I send everything back to ZBrush to update those meshes with the new UVs, I'm gonna select all these meshes and make sure to edit, delete by type, history, and go to the custom and freeze transforms just to be safe. All right, one thing, one more thing I want to do is just gonna step through, make sure everything looks good on these tiles. So this is the bottom bun and its sauce, fluid mesh, top sauce, top bun, Yep. Top patty, bottom patty. I should put these in another group called patties. Patties GRP. So I can, the cheese looks good. Cucumbers, onions, patty fluid meshes, charred meat top one. Okay. Everything looks good. So I'll come back in ZBrush. All right. Back in ZBrush, I made sure to hit all low because I'm importing subdivision one of everything. Start with the top one, do an import, bring in the top one, top one shell. And it didn't scream at me. So everything's fine. And just to be sure everything came through, I'll solo it and use Morph UV. Morph UV is somewhere in, um, I think the UV, UV map uh, section. So I put it on the shelf. I'll just do Morph UV just to check to make sure it has now gotten UVs. All right, so I'm gonna go down, pause the video and import all of them and I'll come back when it's time to bake. All right, so everything is imported and now it's time to bake. So I've turned off all the meshes that I know I'm not gonna need maps for. I'm going to start with the top bun. So I'm going to turn everything off and just make sure the top bun is active. And go to my multi map exporter. So Z plugin, multi map exporter. I'm going to bake a displacement normal. And I probably won't need this for this top bun, but I'm still going to go for a ambient occlusion and a cavity map. I've already exported the mesh in Maya, so I don't need to check this. Uh, merge maps should not be on. I don't need it because I know how my tile is set up. Uh, there's no need to merge maps for two different pieces of geometry. I'm going to go for 8K maps. And I can size them down later if I want to. My map border, I, use, I usually used to set it to 16. But, and I think I've spaced things uh, far enough that it shouldn't be bad, but I'll set to eight. Export options under displacement. I want to turn on three channels because I want uh, displacement map to be placed in all three channels. I want 32 bit EXR and I'm going to bake with a mid value of 0.5 so that I get a grayscale map. I'm baking for subdivision level one for the normal map. I do not want to smooth UV. I just want tangent space normals and soft normals on. And for cavity, I'll leave that as is. I'll see what I get in ambient occlusion. I'll leave that as is too. I will not turn on adaptive. That's for very, very high quality, but it, it takes a long time to bake. So I won't, I, I won't leave it off. And I think this is all I need. Also baking for sub D1. 
and I'll go ahead and create maps. Actually, there is something else I have to do. I'm going to come to file names, make sure UDIM is checked. And yeah, these are usually my typical settings. I want TIFF format for everything. It's pretty high quality for all my 8-bit maps. TIFF format for the EXR. It's going to be 32-bit format. Make sure this is off. And these are the post fixes I like to use. Displacement, normal, base color, AO, cavity. I just wanted to show this. And I'll create the maps. And I'll be back so we can take a look at the maps. Since I'm baking by UV UDIM set, uh, one thing I do want to point out is that I will use a prefix. So this one's a top one. So I'll use top one underscore. And then it will make sure that it renames with uh, the appropriate map and then the UDIM tile. But this identifier is important to put there. It took five minutes to do this top button and it looks pretty good. So here's everything. Here's my AO. This AO map is really good. I like that. This is my normal map. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. They look really nice. And let me check my EXR in Photoshop. I'm just going to go as alpha just to open it. Okay, this one is for the uh, the singe so that it doesn't have a lot to show so let me pick one that has a lot to show uh tile one yeah there it is so that's my 0.5 displacement map so i'm going to go down and get them by the various udim sets uh the next one will be the cucumbers i'll turn the cucumbers on they're on one udim set with their seeds so I'm going to push this out and I'm going to push all of them out. And when everything is done, I'll come back so we can take a look at all the maps together. I just got done with uh, the cucumbers and I was checking out the displacement map for it. Way it's very subtle had me worried about whether or not it was pulling all the correct information. But when I added curves, that information is all there. If I add curves in Photoshop and I go down, it's, it's there. It's just not showing as well but yeah all the information is in there i just wanted to point out that even though they look uh fairly white it's all in there it's just i haven't baked a 0.5 bit value uh displacement map in quite a while so uh, this is new to me usually i'm accustomed to the uh the zero mid value displacement maps which is pure black and white high contrast all right i'll be back with all the bakes i'm done baking all the maps this is the last one the main fluid mesh and I want to clarify something that I said. Initially, I said uh, that I don't trust anything other than EXR displacement maps. I should have been more specific. I don't trust anything other than 32-bit displacement maps. ZBrush is incapable of exporting uh, TIFF displacement maps in 32-bit format. So that already lets me know that that TIFF displacement map option that it gives you is not as valuable as this EXR option. And as I mentioned before, you will be limited to TIFF files if it has to merge maps, if it has to take two pieces of geometry and uh, bake them individually and then try to merge them together, then you're limited to TIFF files. Or it just won't merge them, it will keep them separate files, which means you would have to apply those individual files to the individual meshes, even though they're sharing the same tile so it's a little messy just remember the objective is to ensure that each individual mesh is on its own tile so that when we come into zbrush we can push out 32-bit exr displacement maps because only 32-bit displacement map files have all the information you need for the displacement to behave correctly here are all the baked maps i have the fluid mesh uh bottom bun patties pretty much they're broken up in the same way in which the textures are broken up or uh, how the UDIM sets are broken up. And I did bake a cavity and AO for everything, but I don't think I'm going to use it for most of them. I really only care to use it on the patties for now. And I actually I actually might use it as a mask to, to generate some, some color data for my albedo or my base color maps. I'm not quite sure yet, but I might do that. I, I definitely will be painting on top of it, but I'll use them to produce some some light color data. But the primary thing that I really, really want to try with uh, the cavity map and the AO map is to sort of invert it and pump it into the coat uh, of the material so that the areas that are white 
produce like a, a really high highlight in the coat areas. And I'll compare that to my fluid meshes and see if it's helping to sell that this fluid in those crevices better than my fluid meshes. So that's the, the primary reason I wanted them. All right, so I'm going to head into Maya and uh, start assembling all these textures and plug them into uh, their respective meshes. All right, the first thing, the first thing I'm going to do in Maya before I start importing these maps into these materials is prepare these meshes for displacement. So I'll start with just one. I'll go over here, go into the Shape tab, go into Arnold, and go all the way down to Subdivision and Displacement Attributes. And I'm going to set the settings for this one, and then I'm going to go into the Attribute Spreadsheet, and it'll just allow me to set it to, for all of them. So the first thing I want to choose is the type of subdivision I want, and this is the popular one, Cat, Cat Clark. And in ZBrush, a majority of these meshes have or pretty much all of them have five subdivision levels. So I'm going to need four iterations of subdivisions to get to five. So I'm going to move this up to four. Now, depending on how slow or fast my renders are, I might uh, decrease or increase this number for specific meshes because I do have normal maps and I don't want um, asking the displacement to do all the detailing is it's a bit much. So four is about good, but if I, I see that it's not pulling as much information as I need, I will bump it up to five for certain meshes. I, I might do that. Well, I, ca I can't bump it up to five if the mesh in ZBrush wasn't subdivided to subdivision level six. So four is pretty much the max. If I want to bump it up to five, I'd have to go into ZBrush and subdivide one more time and uh, re-export maps. But the only reason why I would do that is if I went really close and I realized that the five subdivision levels that I baked at is not good enough and there's faceting. So that would be the only excuse to go and add one more subdivision level. So anyway, that's, it's going to be four to get to my default of five subdivisions in ZBrush. And then I'm going to come down here and this setting is linear is the, is the best choice based on my past experience, linear. And then since I have a mid value of 0.5, I have to make sure I set that over here to 0.5. If I had a zero, I'd leave it at zero. And the last feature I want to turn on is auto bump. And this allows Maya to pull granular data from the displacement map and treat it like a bump map. So it supplements all this subdivision that's happening over here to pull uh, displacement data, it, it will go in there and say, okay, but there's a lot more information in your displacement map. And I know you're only subdividing four times. So I'm going to pull all the little bits of data and I'm going to make it act like a bump map. It just helps it look a little bit more richer. Like it, it has a lot of the detail pulled. This in conjunction with my normal map will make for a really strong uh, detail pulled from the maps. So now that I've gotten this one, I'm going to go into Windows, General, Attribute, Spreadsheet, and then I'm going to do all the meshes that need displacement together. Some of them I am going to dial back on their displacement uh, after, but let me first get everybody. So or everybody that needs it. So I know I have this one. I'm just going to select it so that it shows up in the Attribute Spreadsheet. Then I want the uh, singe, and I want the breadcrumbs, and I want my cucumbers, my sauce, my cheese, and I need to go get my cucumber seeds. So I'll grab them. And I definitely need this fluid mesh. I need this bottom bun. And then I need my patties. I got the cheese already. I need the other cheese and the patties need all of them. Then I need my onions. And then everything else just doesn't rely on a displacement map. Charred meat doesn't need it. Patty fluids don't need it. And yeah, that's everybody that's going to use displacement or maps in general. And I'll extend here, go to the Arnold tab and the top bun should have all its settings already in there. So then it becomes very easy to spot it. And sp this 
attribute spreadsheet, it's really hard to find uh, attributes on it. So this is one way I can see the difference and know that I have to change this entire column. So I can just do C and hit enter. And I go here and I say four subdivision levels for everyone. And I go here and I type L and it just puts in linear. And I go here and I type 0 0.5. And the last thing I need to do is enable auto bump on everybody. So I can just type one and that should turn it on and everything. So that's just a quick way to get them all set. But I am going to go back in and make sure that some of these meshes that just don't have the subdivision aren't being pushed subdivided that much. One particular mesh that I don't think has well, it does have the subdivisions, but I don't want it being subdivided too much is the seeds. So in order to save some resources, I will go to them and just make it three for them. And three is about good. If it's not looking good, then I'll, I'll go back and change it. But I, I do think that in, uh, in ZBrush, there's only three subdivision levels. I'll go and check, but I think, you know, I'm, I'll just leave them at four, see how they look. And then um, make the, the change down to three if it just is taking too long to render because I have quite a few maps. Time to start wiring these uh, maps to their respective meshes. I'm going to start with uh, the top one. So I'll select the top one, select its material from the attribute editor, go into my hypershade, map it. And the first thing I want to do is load in a displacement shader and pipe this displacement to the shading group. You can delete that. And I'm going to go tab file and bring in a texture. I want to make sure the texture is set to raw. So I'll go to utilities raw because I want my displacement map in the raw. Next, I'm going to navigate to my texture on file and just have to select the first one. It will load in everything. So I'm looking for top button right there, top button displacement. So I say top button, I'll pick 1001, open. And then I have to specify that it's a UDIM texture. So I click here, say UDIM. And it tells me it found three files, so that's good. I'm going to leave the preview quality at 4K because I don't want to uh, make my crash. Uh, and the nature of this channel, it does not receive a vector or the, the three uh, uh, component parameter. So that's why it was good to turn on three channels in ZBrush because it's put that grayscale displacement map in each and every one of these channels. So I can just grab red and connect it to displacement and my displacement map is connected. And I'm just going to connect all of them and um, and test the render afterwards and, and troubleshoot whatever issues arise. I am going to name this properly. I go file top button. I want to make sure that these are easily identifiable and I go displacement shader top button. And that just allows me to have better track of my nodes. Next thing I want to do is connect the normal maps. I'm going to hit tab, go AI normal and tab file and same deal. Load in the normal map. Put the top button. So I go top button normal one. I make sure it's set to UDIM and make sure it's also set to raw. I want to use the file as it's raw. I'll go file, uh, top bun, and I did leave something out. I'm supposed to say top bun normal. I think that was something I used to do. No, no, it's fine. I think I just used to do top uh, bun. Yeah, it did list the what map is in, so that's fine. This one, I want to use uh, all the data that's coming from it, so I'll take the color, put it in input and then plug the output color into the normal. That should be it. It's set to raw AI normal map. I'll make sure I call this top button. And that's it. 
So let me do a quick test before I plug in all the rest of them. I just want to see whether it looks good. Then I'll plug in all of them and come back and and then make do some quick tests to see how uh, these maps are working with various parameters for the shaders. So I'm going to open the renderer and I'm going to hit play. I'm actually going to stop it and just focus on the bun. I just want to make sure that the bun came in correctly. So I'll hide everything else. All right, so let me come over here and just first close this, open it again and hide everything except the bun, the top bun. So I can very quickly see what's going on. Back to render. Okay. Okay, so it came through. It's looking good. It's in there. I want to make sure I can differentiate between what the normal map is doing and what the displacement map is doing. So I'm going to stop this temporarily. Save it. And then disconnect the normal map. And cook again. Okay, so that's the normal map is very strong. It's doing a very good job. Let me isolate the render to a specific region so I can get faster feedback. Okay, and store this. Okay, yeah, so the normal map is doing its thing. All right, so I'm going to push it back in there. And then I'm going to connect everything and I'll come back with everything connected so we can take a look at the end result. I want to shift around the colors just to see the way things are going to look. So I'll be back with everything connected with the same way I set up the top on and we can take a look at the results. One thing I forgot to mention is that this AI normal map node uh, this is these are the settings on a tangent space that definitely needs to be checked and then colors decide uh, Depending on how things turn out. Sometimes you have to toggle these values I know in 3ds max you would have to be playing around with some of these values to get uh, the default Normal map settings from ZBrush to work correctly. But yeah, this is the setting for the AI normal map node I was able to connect all the materials up with their respective displacement and normal map. There is one bit of very important information that I forgot to mention. When I load in these textures, I turn off filter type. If you don't turn it off, uh, it's going to modify the texture map significantly. It produces uh, some type of blurring or paring down of the texture. Definitely don't want filter type to be on for any of these textures. So this is scene i have loaded in a copy of my reference image i just want to be able to sample some of the colors just to initially gauge some settings that i'm going to play with so i'm going to open the renderer and hit play and see what i have from all the connected textures since this is the first time i'm rendering i'm going to give arnold an opportunity to create its local format on the file system it's uh it's a .tx file, so it's going to take all these 8K textures that I'm loading in and convert them. It'll take a while for this to show up, but after this, renders would be a lot faster because those files would have already been created. Now we're able to see the detail. Um, I like that all that bubble detail for the fluid mesh is coming through. But I'm going to make some just minor changes initially to everything that's supposed to be a fluid. So let me just, just so it doesn't spend all the time trying to render this entire thing. I'll just render this central region. And the first thing I'll do is just switch over this mesh, make sure the fluid mesh is has transmission active because transmission is going to be fully active. So I'll crank that up. 
and that feels a little awkward let me check the render settings make sure that I have enough uh, data in my ray depth settings yeah that's enough transmission depth is what I should be looking at yeah that's really weird that I had to change that again uh, but yeah I guess it's some weird buggy stuff but yeah if you get a black mesh it means that uh, you have not told it how many meshes can be stacked uh, behind transmission all right so now that that is fixed I'm also going to select the the other fluid meshes and I forgot to turn these on so shift H to make sure they're on and the material that is responsible for the fluid meshes underneath the bun and uh, on the individual paddies is what I'm focusing on now so I'm going to make sure that I include this region so I can see it down here. I'm going to crank up transmission. Yeah, that is a weird bug. So it looks like I have to go back to my settings, set it to zero and set it to 10 again for it to recognize the, the layered uh, transmission. I'll keep that in mind. The last thing I'm going to do before I close out this lesson is pick some initial base colors from my reference just so I can see how things are going to work on the base color maps that I'm going to be painting in Substance. In the next lesson, I'll be going into Substance and getting started with the painting, more than likely with the top bun. I'm going to stop this render here minimize it and just come over here and sample some general colors from this reference so i'll take this go up to my color and pick uh, some mid-range value for the entire thing i'll go to my cucumbers pick some green value here i'll go to the sauce that go to the cheese uh, go to the patties okay it looks like I have the wrong thing selected so I'll just go to the patties here pick one of these brown colors Go to my onions. Just charred onions and pick this black color. I want to talk about how you want to keep uh, your base color values in range when I go into substance within a certain range. You don't want to go too far black or too far white. So I'll talk about that when we get there. Then this bottom bun. I'm going to pick something here. All right, and that should be fine. And then I have the char too. So I'll pick the charred meat, which is very dark too. Yeah, about there. All right, so now I'm going to let it render just to have an idea of what I'm going to get started with. I was going to play around with the roughness a little bit, but there's no need for that. Uh, we'll get to it eventually. I think the roughness, the painting of all the roughness maps has its own uh, lesson. I'll be using some filters, some of my cavity and ambient occlusion maps, and then also doing some hand painting. But the last burger project that I did, I think I didn't use any roughness maps. I have that project open here. And um, it's basically this double cheeseburger. Uh, I didn't use, uh, it has a lot more assets, very expensive asset, but I didn't use any roughness maps. I used uh, just a roughness parameter and just set a reasonable parameter for everything. But this time I'm going to paint because this project is supposed to be an evolution of the workflow from this, this one. Let me remove this region mask and just do a render 
and then I'll let it go to completion just to, to see what I should be preparing myself to expect from this. And I also want to remind you that for my second lesson, I have a lot of HDRIs that are plugged into a switch. So I will be playing around with, with them, with the various different HDRIs. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different ones. So I'll be going back and forth between them to see which of them is going to be our main one. And I'll definitely still use the other one so that I can see how this asset interacts with different, under different lighting scenarios, uh, nighttime lighting, uh, outside lighting, indoor lighting. That was what I used to pick all these. If you remember in, uh, I think the second lesson, I was very intentional about which ones I picked and, and the purpose they were going to serve. All right, so I'll let this cook. You'll probably see this as uh, the thumbnail. And in the next lesson, I'll get started with the painting of this acid and substance painter. I do have to set up the file and I'm going to use a, a common approach of, of sending a, a mesh to substance painter that is uh, fairly dense, just so I don't have to import normal or displacement maps into substance painter and have something that uh, properly approximates this piece so I can paint properly. So I'll see you in the next lesson where we start painting the albedo or base color maps in Substance Painter.